So we all know that the internet has been great in spreading freedom around the world in places like Egypt. That's why communist countries like North Korea and China limit internet access to their citizens. You know, I was in China about three years ago, and when I tried to Google the United States Bill of Rights, my browser immediately shut down. And then, uh, here, just last month, another one. <laughs> um, and then here, just last month, China blocked uh, both Gmail and Google search. But here in America, we have an unprecedented amount of government transparency. And it's not just because of the tools that the politicians provide that enable us to watch them around the clock. You know, things like streaming those incredibly boring committee hearings or publishing all those documents online. Not just also because of the 24-hour news network, but also because each one of us carries a little camera, video camera, computer, basically an entire media company in our pockets. And because of that, politicians have become a lot like celebrities in that they can't go anywhere without a camera pointed at them. They're always, they can't go to dinner without you know, their picture being tweeted or have the constant request for a selfie. They're being watched around the clock. Now, all this government transparency is good, but I contend that there are some bad elements that no one's talking about. I see them every day with my own eyes. In fact, I've even made it happen. Don't get me wrong. Government transparency is far more good than bad, far more good, but there is a bad, like anything bad, we need to acknowledge it, talk about it, and try to fix it. A lot of people say that the internet has made government more honest. If by honest you mean we have less government corruption, then I totally agree. But if by honest you mean that our politicians are doing what they think is right, I disagree in many cases. So this is my staff at Push Digital. We are a political digital company that works with politicians around the country. And I only tell you that so you can understand the way we work with them on a daily basis and how I kind of get all this, okay? Anyway, I just stepped in one day and I took this picture as they were working, doing their normal thing like they do every day. But then I, I said, hey, they looked up and saw I had a camera pointed at them, okay? And they do what every single one of us do. They smiled. My developer over there, who's kind of nuts, he even decided to play up to the camera, okay? Why? Why the difference in these two pictures? Because it is a natural human reaction to act different when there is a camera pointed at you. Every single one of us do it. We want to look good, right? Because a lot of people could potentially see that picture or that camera, and that's exactly what's happening in government right now. Our politicians always have a camera pointed at them, so they're not acting natural. They're playing up to the camera. They don't do what normal human beings do, like talk, like you know, normal people, and, and compromise to try to come up with solutions and actually get things done. They don't work behind the scenes anymore because behind the scenes doesn't exist. And as a result, we have a country where the word compromise is bad. Our nation is stagnant. We're not getting anything done. Washington really can't get a damn thing done. Y'all know this. And because of it, we have one of the most ideologically divisive Congresses in U.S. history. Here in South Carolina last year, we had a bunch of right-wing legal scholars who, uh, <laughs> who decided it would be a really good idea for us to try to nullify Obamacare because, you know, nullification really worked out for South Carolina the last time we tried it. <laughs> I mean, seriously. Anyway, this bill was completely unconstitutional. Even most of its supporters acknowledged so behind the scenes, including its author who said there was literally no American legal precedent for the constitutionality of this bill. Look, you and I could argue this bill all day on Facebook, but you sure as hell couldn't do it in a courtroom, okay? But the drumbeat began by the fringe right wing. And they said, if you don't support the nullification of Obamacare, you are insufficiently conservative. You are a Republican in name only, a rhino. So... A strategy of appeasement began, and your South Carolina Senate spent six weeks, guys, six friggin' weeks doing nothing else but debating this bill, wasting time. And when it was eventually killed, it wasn't killed on a vote because, no, they couldn't vote on it because this bill had become a proxy for Obamacare, and if they voted for it, the state of South Carolina would have racked up tens of millions of dollars in legal, fields, legal bills trying to fight for this, and it would have never passed anyway. So it was killed on a technicality by the lieutenant governor. Now, all that to say, this is a really good example of how we take a bad bill, something completely unconstitutional, a waste of time, but we push it because it's 100% going nuts. The mob is driving it online. You know, the founding fathers of this country, we're all taught this in school, right? The founding fathers, uh, after the American Revolution, they did something extraordinary. They created a democracy. But that just isn't true. Or rather, it's only about half true. In fact, our founding fathers actually hated democracy. Don't believe me? Let's read what a couple of them had to say. James Madison said that in a democracy, there is nothing to check the inducement to sacrifice the weaker party or the obnoxious individual. 
John Adams said, remember, democracy never lasts long. It soon wastes, exhausts, and murders itself. There was never a democracy yet that did not commit suicide. And Chief Justice John Marshall said, between a balanced republic and a democracy, the difference is like that between order and chaos. If you go back and you read the founding documents of this country, repeatedly the founding fathers bashed the idea of a democracy and instead promoted the republic they were trying to create. And there's a big, big difference. In a democracy, we create policy directly ourselves. But in a republic, we elect those who we trust to make those decisions for us. But since the time of Andrew Jackson, we've been sliding further and further away from this idea of a republic and closer and closer to this idea of a democracy. And with the internet, we're nearly there. Our legislators deciding to legislate for the Facebook-like. And guys, that's horrible. You know, what we're really doing is we're eliminating the ability for our guys, to, for our politicians, to work behind the scenes, to show that political courageousness, to, to stand up against the mob, to do the right thing. We've completely removed the ability to compromise behind the scenes, right? Think about this. The Constitution of the United States would never have been written today. One of the very first things the Constitutional Convention did was vote to make its proceedings a secret so that they can compromise and bargain without the influence of the mob. The Great Compromise, which created the House and the Senate, only passed because it was decided that our United States senators would be elected by state legislators and not directly by the people. And that's because the founders did not believe that the mob, that the people, that we could all be trusted to make the best decision all the time. And you know what? Now that we have a nation that is spending $17 trillion more than it has, it looks like they were right. There's always this appetite to spend, 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 but never an appetite to raise taxes or to cut programs in any substantive way, right? Now, nobody knows who said this. It's been kind of controversial in recent years, but it's pretty brilliant. A democracy will continue to exist up until the time that voters discover that they can vote for themselves generous gifts from the public treasury. From that moment on, the majority always votes for the candidates who promise the most benefits from the public treasury, with the result that every democracy will finally collapse due to loose fiscal policy, which is always followed by a dictatorship. In 2008, well, let me back up here for a second. Last year, 2014, a few years later, Pia Mancini gave a great TED Talk last year. It was listed as one of the best and most popular talks of last year when she asked the question, what is a democracy for an internet era? She goes on to say that she doesn't think but that politicians are listening to people. I totally disagree. I think politicians are listening to people. I just think they're listening to the wrong people at the wrong time. They're not listening to the average American. They're listening to the extremists from both sides of the aisle because they're the ones screaming through social media. They're the only ones that can be heard. In 2008, a Republican president and his Republican financial advisor said that if we didn't pass TARP, the American economy would collapse, the global economy would collapse soon thereafter because of the American economy collapsing, and we would go into a state of anarchy. But the right-wing fringe started the drumbeat and said, if you vote for TARP, you are a rhino, and we're taking you out in, that, in your election. Now, I don't know what would happen if we didn't pass TARP. I'm no financial expert. What I do know is that, our, is that our elected leaders listened to the social mob instead of the financial experts that knew what the hell they were talking about. And TARP didn't pass the first time around. It eventually did pass, but it cost countless politicians their elections. This is a great example. I'm not here trying to like, talk about the merits of TARP, but this is a good example of how a few people are raising hell online and they're being listened to for one reason. They're the ones picking our leaders. Very few seats are actually decided in general elections. Most of them are decided in primaries, and very, very few people are voting in primaries. This last time around, Montana had the best voter turnout with 26%. Iowa had the lowest at 8%. And by the time we got around to the general election, we had the lowest voter turnout since World War II. So here we're being hit with a double whammy. Politicians are terrified of the electoral consequences of making sound but unpopular decisions. So they're playing to the camera in everyone's pocket. Next, the few people that are voting and choosing our leaders are amplifying their voices through social media. So that, what is the solution? Because that's why we're here, right? To talk about ideas, to talk about solutions. I don't think the solution is less social media. I think the solution is more social media. The average American is online. They're playing on Facebook all day, right? But they're not engaging in the daily political conversations, nor are they getting involved in the political process. And as a result, we've got extremists from both aisles who are using social media to raise all kind of hell. They're the only ones being listened to. Thus, we have no compromises happening, and this country has become completely stagnant. 
Second, we need to encourage the courageous people we know to run for office. The people who don't mind raising a little cane. The people who will stand up to the social mob and do what they think is right. That's why we elect them. That's what a republic is. And when they stand up to the mob and do what they think is right, we have their back instead of throwing them under the bus. Lastly, we reduce the ability to play to the camera in your pocket by eliminating the ability to stay in office until you're carried out in a casket. We enact term limits. If you look at this chart, you see what the fundamental problem in governance is. The name of the game has become staying in the game, and it makes making those tough decisions impossible and all but demands playing to the camera. So, what I am suggesting here is that we empower our elected officials after we vote for them to stand up to the mob and to do what they think is right. Let me put it another way. If I'm a chef, giving you exactly what you want is a great idea. But me telling you what you want to hear is horrible if I am a, if I am a mechanic or if I am a doctor. The internet has been great for this country. We're able to communicate with our politicians in a way like never before. We've got more government transparency and we have reduced corruption. But if we don't correct the path we're on, we're going to end up with a bunch of leaders who give not we, but the vocal few, everything they want all the time, not because it's the right thing to do, but because it's what they must do to stay in office. That won't be good for any of us. Thank you.